Hey there, Rick Sage, recording at the Rimrock Studios in Bishop, California. Welcome to Season 2 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, where I speak with retailers, brand managers, athletes, executives, and others in the outdoor biz and share their stories, tips, advice, productivity tricks, and ideas you can use to take your career or business to the next level. Today's podcast is brought to you by WordPress. I've used WordPress to build a number of websites, including Stillwaters Consulting and the Outdoor Biz Podcast. There are a number of themes and plugins available, both free and for purchase, enabling you to easily create the custom look and feel you want. If you're starting an online business, publishing a blog, and looking to take your online presence to the next level, visit theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash WordPress and get going today. With simple installation tools and thousands of themes to choose from, you'll be up and running in no time. Go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash WordPress and get your site launched today. I'm excited to have Brian Hennessy, CEO and co-founder of Talkoot and founder of Thread on the show today. As Brian so eloquently says, Thread is a writing studio that helps great brands like Adidas, Burton, Sims Fishing, and others tell their story, and Talkoot is a cloud-based platform that brings the dark ninja skills of content creators together in one bright, sunny, crazily useful place. Brian and I talk about how framing impacts brand stories and how a guy with a degree in economics got into storytelling. Hey, Brian, great to speak with you today. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Rick. Yeah, good uh, to, Great to be here. Yeah, good to, good to catch up again. We spoke, uh, what, a week or so ago. You kind of got me up to speed on all the cool things you're doing. Why don't you give us a little bit about your background yeah. before we go too far down the road? Yeah, sure. Um, I have a, a kind of story studio called Thread. And we help brands with their stories. Um, you know, it used to be uh, mostly marketing. I started out as a as a copywriter, and uh, eventually became a head writer at Adidas, kind of global head writer, um, overseeing the Adidas store. And then I left and started my own company. And at first, we were doing a lot of um, just plain old copywriting and ads. <laughs> um, but then uh, I really got into story, and not just storytelling, but uh, kind of deep. What, what story is and, and how it works in our, you know, ping pongs around our brain. And anymore, we're doing a lot of uh, just story consulting, helping brands find their story and use it to do all sorts of things. Yeah, I, I can't wait to dig into more of that. That's what intrigued yeah. me about our conversation last week. So I did a little research. Looks like you've got a degree in econ- economics. How did you get into writing? <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, interesting. I got out of. Uh, I, you know, my, none of my family went to college and uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college. And I thought everyone just kind of went to college to become a business person. Oh, and so right. economics sounded like a, a good, solid thing my mom would be proud of. And uh, <laughs> I got I got out of college and I, I didn't know uh, what to do. And I got a job at an advertising agency and marketing research. A big, oh, wow. uh, Leo Burnett, which is kind of the, the guys who invented Captain Crunch and Fruit of the uh, 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 Tony the Tiger, <laughs> and and it was there that uh, I would show up with my you know in Chicago with my slacks and my tie at you know eight o'clock in the morning, and then <laughs> then these guys would roll in at ten o'clock in the afternoon with ponytails and wearing duster jackets. It was back in the nineties. And I was like, what, what do they do? <laughs> right. How do I do that? <laughs> like they're the copywriters. And I'm like, what's a copywriter and how do you do that? Yeah. And, uh, so that's why I started. I went to, went back to school to at Northwestern and got a degree and, uh, I went to the journalism school and they have a, a degree in advertising and I got a degree in advertising and, and that was that. And here you are all these years later. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. And you wrote for Adidas for about six years. What was that like? Yeah, it was, uh, I was in Europe, was right? You were in Europe. Yeah, it was, it was here. It started okay. out here. Um, uh, right now we live in, I live in Oregon and, uh, it was here in Oregon. Half their uh, headquarters is split 50, 50, mm, okay. uh, here. And, but they were founded in Germany. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I got a job here, worked here a couple of years, um, they asked me to go over to Germany, so I went over there, and that's when I became the the kind of head writer at Adidas and started overseeing the uh, gigantic story that is Adidas. And that was <laughs> that was amazing. It was just that yeah. was the first time you know I had never traveled overseas in college or anything. So the first time I ever went overseas was uh, a trip uh, for Adidas, and it just blew my mind. I bet, I bet, yeah. And so, was that where you experienced the brand framing shift we were talking about the other day? Yeah, you know what? That's not where I figured it out, but that's yeah. where I came across the basically the pain point. I uh-huh. was when I became global writing director. I was 
part of what I did, you know, I, I started out writing, but by the end, a lot of what I did was just a lot of policing and going around and saying, Hey, mm. you can't say that. Like, mm. That's not the Adidas brand. And, and, uh, trying to keep everyone kind of in one on one story. Mm -hmm. And the way I like, I kind of see brands as, you know, large or small as kind of these story systems where you have products and those product stories have to ladder up to a category story, which then has to ladder up to a business unit story probably. And then probably has to ladder up to your big brand, you know, your reason for being here. Right, right. And, you know, you have all these people off inventing really cool stuff and doing great work. You know, you'd see stuff and it wasn't, no one was doing anything wrong. Yeah. It's just that no one was coordinating and, you know, people were just kind of inventing stories as they went just to <laughs> right. sell things in. And you're like, we, we're not, that's not our brand at all. And so, <laughs> and so where did you figure that, that out as it applies to framing and the, the shift in framing of a brand's ethos or message or something? Yeah. That was, you know, I did a project when I left, I did a project, um, before I was actually even in the, um, uh, got deep into the outdoor world. I mm. worked in this, this company that had a whole bunch of apartments up and down the, the West coast. Mm. And, um, they were the company that actually the, the real estate company that, um, leased Apple, their first headquarters. Oh, wow. And they were just a, they were just a, um, they had no brand. They were just really good at buying low and selling high. <laughs> and, um, they needed to, they wanted to bring in some investors and they, you know, the investors said, well, listen, you, you do a great job of buying low and selling high, but you need a brand and we don't invest in anything if you don't have a brand. Yeah. So they came to, they came to, uh, me at, uh, thread. Mm -hmm. And th that was the first time I, you know, started going, you know, what? I'm going to, I'm going to write the story because really to, to, to be honest, I didn't love the brand myself. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, at that point I knew like I have, I have to fall in love with the brand to get other people to love what, you know, what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm seeing all these apartments and some of them I don't love and some of them I think are great, but I have to find something I love about this. And then I have to write it down. And yeah. that was the first time I kind of did a story first. And I just wrote a paragraph that I felt really great about. Yeah. And then after that, everything seemed to go well, everything kind of, once I wrote that story and I knew what this brand was about, we did interiors, we did retail, you know, kind wow. of retail, retail interiors and mm -hmm. like changed how people gave tours of the buildings, mm -hmm. changed, how, you know, changed the, the whole kind of, uh, experience of people who rent there and it just changed everything. And that was the first eye opening thing. And so that's after that, the big success there, I was like, I need to look into that because yeah, I think that I'm onto really, something here. Yeah. Exactly. I think I'm onto something. I need to read about can find more out about story. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you were with the apartment company, did you guys also mm -hmm. marry the brand story to imagery? Yeah. yeah. And actually that okay. was the interesting thing, like even imagery. So for instance, that was a big breakthrough. Um, what we figured out is back, back then, I know it's going to sound kind of, um, everyone will probably go like, Oh yeah, of course. Duh. But <laughs> now, back yeah, in, these days. Yeah. yeah. But back yeah, when back you were doing early, it, right. Back in the two thousands, I, what was driving me crazy is that everybody kept calling these things units. And you're, I'm like, why a unit? Well, I don't want to live in a unit. Right. Why do we keep calling these things units? Right. They're homes that they're, you know, people raise their kids in these places. Yeah. These are homes. And so what the, the kind of the frame that we built for them and, and used for them is, um, uh, home isn't the four walls. It's not the, you know, stainless steel things. It's not the granite countertops. Home is what happens inside the right, right, walls. Right. And so we, we concentrated everything. Everything we talked about was like, you know, um, first birthdays and where you put the dog dish. <laughs> and we did everything about creating a great home inside these, inside these apartments. Mm -hmm. And it changed everything. And, um, one of the things that, that we were, I was working with this designer who I absolutely love the designer and, um, we had a great time working on this, but he was, he was coming up with these, the photography was this big, beautiful photography of these apartment buildings. And I'm like, no, if it's home and we're talking about home, let's make it like human photography. Yeah, like, there's people in there. Yeah. Exactly. People yeah. in there, take it like the mom took a picture of their kid because that's what we want to make yeah. people feel like. Very you can cool. create a, a, a life there. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That makes total sense. And it seems, you're right. It seems like such a no brainer now, but back then when you were yeah. stumbling onto it, it was completely foreign to everybody. Yeah, and, now, now everyone, oh, yeah, go ahead. everyone does it. Yeah. 
Um, talk to us more about how Adidas shifted their framing away from the, we were talking about how they were, you know, all these brands used to be warrior and competition and combat mm-hmm. and Adidas moved away from that. How did that come about? Yeah. Well, when we first started working um, on the Adidas narrative identity, um, we actually had the chance to work with an amazing woman um, in the UK and she was a linguistic psychologist. Oh, wow. And what she was talking and this is, you know, I had no idea. I just knew how to write a story and I knew, you know, if I wrote a good one or a bad one, <laughs> but she, she kind of let me in on framing and how we think in frames. Mm. And just before we talk about the, the frame within the, the sport industry, the thing that you have to know before that is that we all think in these invisible frames, these big metaphors. Mm-hmm. And so I think we were talking about them before, but when we're yeah, born, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're a blank slate. As a baby, you know, three weeks old, we have no connections in our brains. And then so we're laying there in the crib and then you're, you know, you cry, something's wrong and your mom comes in and picks you up and she goes, oh, you must be hungry. So she feeds you and she puts you back down. Mm-hmm. And then you start crying again and something's wrong and your mom comes in and goes, oh, you need a diaper change. So she picks you up, changes your diaper, you feel better and sets you back down. <laughs> and this happens hundreds and you know thousands yeah. of times before you can even speak and what happens is the, the idea of good and the idea of up grow together in your brain mm. and there's actually a, a physical a synapse the synapses connect so that you can't think of good without thinking of up and up is good and no matter where you go in the world up is always good and good is always up yeah, yeah. that's why the stock market is up and you feel up and up is always positive and yeah. so there's, we think in all these invisible frames. Yeah. And one of the things um, that we do is we look at the frames, the invisible frames that people think in within industries. And, you know, you're working for years within an industry and you just, you, you're thinking in a way that um, everybody else thinks and mm-hmm. nobody thinks anything is different. And what we found it in sport, every brand was thinking, was thinking within this frame that sport is conflict. Sport mm-hmm. is war. Winning takes care of everything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I were to tell a, um, you know, one of my writers to go out and drum up some headlines for a new running shoe, they'd come back and it would say like, you know, destroy the road with these new XZ28 <laughs> running shoes, right. blow up the competition. And you're like, why? Yeah, whoa, <laughs> Why are you whoa, equating whoa. everything is? Yeah. And so it all comes from, you know, NFL films and Nike, uh, where everything was about domination and you know, you don't even realize it, yeah. but you're everything, every, we, sometimes when I tell that to people, they're like, well, sport is war or sport is conflict. And you're like, well, I go on a trail run every day. Yeah. And when I go, I go to escape conflict. Right. Yeah. There better not be there. a conflict. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I want to hear the birds chirping. So right. sometimes sport is war, but sometimes sport is something else. And, and what sport always is, it's, you know, and this is what we did with Adidas. We reframed sport and said, okay, for Nike sport is war, but to get out of Nike's frame and get out from the leader's frame, um, let's say sport is creation. It's always creation. You're mm-hmm. always creating a better you. You're, you know, you come together to compete, to push each other further, to figure out how, you know, bet, how much better you can get. And so mm-hmm. sport is always about creativity and it's sometimes about conflict and, and c- competition. That's amazing because you're so right. And it, it, that up and that more concept ties into everything we do in life, right? You want more money. You want more stuff in your house. You want more this, more that. Mm-hmm. And it's really, that's what we're all about. It's interesting. Yeah. And so, it's Nike, amazing. so Adidas was the first one, first brand to shift that yep. frame to creativity. That's great. Yeah. They are now, if you go, you know, look at them. Uh, there's, you know, calling all creators. It's the yeah. creator brand. And the thing is, is that it's not really necessarily much about marketing. Like if you look at their marketing, they start talking about the creative creator brand, but we went into Adidas and we worked with their HR to create an employer brand so that they can mm-hmm. recruit people, mm-hmm. more creative people who, mm-hmm. li- you know, lived and breathed this mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, we rewrote their principles of innovation so they could create more creative products and, uh, kind of create products that are more interesting on many different levels for these creative types of people. And right. we basically went through and used story to change kind of almost everything at Adidas. So you infused everything in the company. That's terrific. Yeah. And we yeah. were talking the other day about some other brands like Patagonia doesn't, isn't so much creative. They're definitely not combative, yep. but they're more protection is what was, is that what we talked about? 
Oh, actually, the um, for the that's, that's and... part of it. Yeah. So if you look at um, when you look at a frame, what you want to do is it's uh, basically brands that um, are really successful. If you look back to when they grew the most uh, and the fastest, um, it was usually because there's a strong founder and they had they just thought this way. Mm-hmm. Like Apple is similar. Uh, Patagonia is similar. We had you had a strong founder who was like, no, this is the way it is. And then they just they kind of the brand becomes an extension of them. Right. And with Patagonia, for instance, I would say that the frame of Patagonia, if you look around and look at their retail spaces and look at their products and look at everything they do, it's that the wilderness is a loved one. Mm-hmm. So That's when right, they yeah. think of the, when they think of the wilderness, it's a relationship with something they, someone they love. And so when you look at the retail spaces, it's open light. It looks like a living room, reclaimed furniture. You could stay there for hours yeah. and hang out. It yeah. feels like it feels like a place you you know want to interact with a loved one. Yeah. And but, so your your first business you started was Thread. That was your writing mm-hmm. group, right? And then Talcoot grew out of Thread. Is that right? That is right. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the things. So we do storytelling. We kind of start at the thirty thousand. Well, we can start anywhere, but we you know use story. We help people with their store brands with their story at the thirty thousand foot level of mm-hmm. like you know who are we and what 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 story are we living? But then that's great. But then if you actually get down to, you know, all the way down to product descriptions, right. um, if that's not coming through your product descriptions, um, there's no reason to think about what that, you know, that 30,000 foot story is. Mm-hmm. And what I found at Adidas was, you know, even after we found their frame and, and understood what to do, it's a lot of hard work to make sure that everyone in the company and everything yeah. is living within that frame. <laughs> and so you could think of like Apple, for instance, if you went to go buy like a new iPad pro and you, you know, you see the ads and you get inspired and you go to the website and the website's beautiful and slick and white and everything's clean and, um, you know, and sophisticated and simple. Mm-hmm. And you go to the product description and it says, you know, the new iPad Pro packed with 32 gigs of hard driving power. <laughs> yeah. yeah, disconnect. <laughs> Total disconnect. And yeah. that's what we were finding with with a lot of our clients. We were writing um, tons of product copy. You know, we, we do a lot of product copy for brands. And um, I had to coach, you know, 30 or 40 writers yeah. how to sound like one writer. And it was really hard to do that um, with spreadsheets and email. And so... Right. Um, I actually, <laughs> I got, I got sued by Africa Bombada, uh, <laughs> 80s rap icon, <laughs> because one of my writers, uh, just, you know, he was bored one day and he thought that these shoes, uh, seemed like they were inspired by a, by an Africa Bombada lyric. And uh-huh. so he, <laughs> so he dropped some lyrics in there Oops. and, uh, Africa Bombada called up and said, I would like you to take that out or give me money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, yeah, that's what I knew that, uh. I had to do something. So we, we created this, uh, kind of content collaboration software, uh, where all of our writers, editors, proofreaders, legal teams at, uh, at the clients, uh, product managers, brand managers can all log in. And it's kind of like an assembly line for great content, you oh, know? Interesting. Yeah. If you think of it, like when you create a product, you know, the client or, you know, someone, someone creates a prototype. And everyone likes that prototype. And then you send it out to be manufactured. Yeah, there's a process, a, definitely a process. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. A, it's a manufacturing process. Right. And con- content needed that same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we have clients who say, here's our voice. And what we do is we go, okay, I understand that voice. We break it down. We understand how you like kind of break it into its component parts. And then we figure out how to mass produce it so that mm-hmm. every, you know, we write Right now, my, uh, the writing studio thread writes about 50,000 pieces of product copy a year. Wow. Um, for lots of different clients. And each one of those comes out. And if you read it, it sounds just like, you know, one person was channeling, you know, writing that voice. That's awesome. And do you work with all kinds of big and small clients in all different spaces? Not only we the do. Outdoor? We are, well, yes. Yeah. We, uh, we work with, uh, everyone from, uh, Tofurky. Okay. <laughs> to uh, business consultants, to Adidas and fishing. Um, but we are, uh, because we're based in Hood River and we have a whole bunch of uh, people who move to the mountains right. uh, and the water. Right. Uh, 
we have a whole bunch of people who love the outdoors. And so we naturally are drawn to the outdoors. Market. Makes total sense. Yeah. And wh- how do you think branding is going to evolve in the next five to 10 years? I mean, obviously this is going to continue to be a st- yeah. uh, an important strategy. You think it's going to move in a different, what direction do you think it's going to move? Absolutely. I think, I think the, you know, you can already see that the era of disruptive advertising, like ads yeah. in magazines and banners, that's gone. That's, yeah. that's going away and it's going to go away even further. And what, um, my take is what happened, you know, of course it's the, it's digital disruption. Digital disruption is everywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, when I first started working at Adidas, um, probably after the first year, I knew somewhat, I knew something about Adidas, but I didn't know a whole bunch because it's really, it was really hard to get a hold of information back in 1997. Um, but now I can get online within four hours. I can know more about Adidas um, than I knew after a year of working there back in 1997. I yeah. know their employment policies. I know their sustainability record. Um, I know where their locations are. I can see their complete line. Um, the, the transparency means that you don't anymore have that shell of advertising. Mm-hmm. You know, back in the day when I first started in advertising, I just loved the big headlines and the funny ads and whatnot. Yeah. But those were basically kind of like shells wrapped around you know, what everyone thought of as boring companies. And inside the boring company, you could be as boring as you want, as long as you had this marketing department that could kind of put lipstick on it and make mm-hmm. it sexy. Mm-hmm. But now your employees are your, are your, you know, advocates, your ambassadors. Yeah. Um, when come, when people come to your offices, they want to see that you live and breathe your brand every day. Right. And that's where these, what we do is we create narrative identities and it's basically like a roadmap. It says, okay, if this is your story, this is what your offices might be like. This is what the content you create might be like. These gotcha. are the kind of products you should create so that it's just this one big holistic experience. And that's where, um, you know, I think that's where everything is going is you're just going to get online and um, you just want to be part of a movement versus um, talked to with sexy advertising. Right, right. And how do you think that's going to be impacted by this new trend we've seen recently? You know, I'm going to use the term fake news for just lack Mm -hmm. of a better term, but there's a lot of stuff that's coming at us these days. When we dig right down into it, a few days, weeks, months later, we find out it was all fake. It was all made up. And, and it was totally wrong. Are you guys finding that you're having to, mm-hmm. to battle against that? Is that impacting what you're doing? You know, that isn't necessarily, I mean, like I can, I can see that it hasn't really impacted us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what we try and, uh, or like basically what we've done is we've put together, um, kind of a, a methodology that we believe in. And that is kind of just be, Rather than, you know, it's funny, we're, we're a, uh, a writing studio and a marketing, you know, we started out as a marketing studio, right. but basically like what we advocate is if you know your story, um, you can stop marketing. You can just be who you are. And I, yeah, you know, again, exactly. I go back, yeah, to, that's a good go point. back to Patagonia. Right. Um, they, I don't, the last time I heard the statistic was they spend 0.05% of their budget on marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the way a brand does that, and that's, you know, it's similar with other brands who have, um, you know, uh, taken the time to grow, uh, and, and just be who they are is that you just are that thing. And so people know who you are and you don't have to kind of have news and you don't have to kind of bang the drum. You just yeah, are. Yeah. If you walk your forward. talk every single day, every single minute, you don't have to explain anything. Exactly. People yeah. look at what you're doing they and just then know. they yeah. tell your story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how that uh, evolves in the next five or 10 years in the, the current environment that we're in with, you know, things being yeah. shifted and things being manufactured and you kind of have to do a double take sometimes, but I think you're we right. Are absolutely. Just, yeah. We are absolutely living in interesting times. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think one thing is that there's the, you know, the, the big rise of direct consumer, consumer brands, the mm-hmm. way I see it is, um, you know, you used to, I, I, I equate it a lot to, um, like, uh, beer because i like beer in <laughs> fact it's friday and just after this i'm gonna go out and there you go beer. say it so am I. <laughs> <laughs> but uh what happened in the brewing industry you know back when i was a kid my dad drank uh budweiser mm-hmm. and there was there was budweiser there was miller and there's a couple of others you know Pabst blue ribbon and, and olympia yep. but pretty much there was just a few 
big, gigantic brands. Yeah. And then craft brewing came along. And now, um, you know, I would, I would call, um, craft brewing kind of a agile beverage development. You have a whole bunch of small brands who are kind of living, you know, seeing what, what they didn't like about beer and creating a new brewery. And they're launching beers, you know, instead of just having one or two beers like Budweiser did, they're launching beers every month and they're doing kind of like, like software development. They're like, try this. You like this? You like that? Right. And that's where, that's where, um, I think, uh, sport and outdoor is going is it's almost going to become kind of agile, um, uh, product development. And the thing is, is that, and this, this gets back to kind of your narrative is, What's really great about these small brands is that they're making products about something. Mm-hmm. They're making mm-hmm. products because they don't like, um, you know, the way it's going now. And you can go to their website and they will tell you what it's about. And that's where marketing is going is instead of kind of this slick advertising about, you know, sexy models and whatnot, right. that's never going to go away. It's always going to be there. Yeah. But really, I love going to these websites going, Oh yeah, they're going to be about this. They're yeah. about sustainability. They're about. Um, you know, something, right, and they're right. always going to be about that. Right, right. And you're right. You're starting, and we're starting to see some of these brands expand that to everything they do. I mean, there for a while they would they would have this, you know, this is our new organic sustainable collection, and now it went yeah. from collection to category, and category to, you know, it's the whole brand that they're they're about. That's kind of shifting. That's that's interesting to watch. Right. That's the thing is that, uh, you know, back in the day, you could have one collection about this and another collection about right, that, right. And a third collection about that. And we call that brand schizophrenia. <laughs> that's, that's the person that shows up at the party and just will agree to anything. <laughs> yeah. Drinks one of everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Has a miserable night. <laughs> yeah. You can create anything as long as all those things are about one thing. Yeah. 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 No, I love that. Yeah. It makes total sense. Yeah. No, that's, that's pretty exciting. I, I look forward to talking with you more about that and yeah. seeing some of the stories that you create. So uh, let's shift Thanks. gears a little bit and tell us about some of the, do you do any work with any nonprofits? Oh, you know what? We're doing work right now. Um, we, we kind of um, ch- uh, choose, uh, you know, one thing to work on and just concentrate on that instead of spending, you know, spreading our, our work around. And one Got thing it. that we're uh-huh. working on right now is with this, uh, a small website called uh, Immigrant Story. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and it's a uh, a retired engineer. He is uh, originally from Pakistan, and uh, he, you know, saw what was going on right now, and uh, he just wanted to have immigrants tell their story. That's awesome. At, yeah, and tell kind of the, the other side of it, and you know what it's like, and and so we we are diving in right there and helping him to um, tell better stories and figure out what his frame is and kind of set him up almost as if he's a magazine. You know, where oh, it's like, cool. Yeah. You know, a magazine, you pick up Fast Company or you pick up, uh, you know, uh, The Economist. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up, pick up Fast Company, pick up The Economist. They're both about business, Mm -hmm. but they're actually not about business. You know, Fast Company is about like, you know, moving fast and breaking things and figuring out, you know, it's about the future. The Economist is like delving deep and becoming an expert in some field. Right. And so, you know, no matter what comes along, like it could be Valentine's Day coming up or it could be, you know, some new thing happens and, you know, the, the, the recession happens along and you're always going to report about what's new, but you're going to have your take on it. So right. what we want to do with him is, uh, and the immigrant story is what is it always going to be about for him? It's, you know, it's what are the immigrant stories going to be about? What mm-hmm. kind of what slice are they, you know, going to reveal about uh, immigration? And, and he could go a lot oh, of different ways with that because it can be just, you know, not only one person, but like my family came from immigrants, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of generations ago. So he could, he could go, you know, pretty far back, as far back as he wants, or <laughs> he can just start about someone who's brand new, you know, just came here, stepped off the plane. Now what do I do? <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, what are some of the outdoor activities you participate in? Oh, you know, right now my uh, my heart belongs to trail running. Okay, very nice. Um, yeah. I moved out here uh, originally. You know, I was from the Midwest, and uh, me and my friends would uh, jump in a car on Friday in Chicago and drive up to uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and in the middle of January, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and camp on the. Uh, Camp on the uh, shores of Lake Superior. Oh my God! Build, build an igloo in <laughs> negative three degree weather, just because 
we so wanted to be outdoors and we just felt so out of place in Chicago. That's hardcore. Yeah. So we actually, uh, me and those two friends, uh, all moved out to, uh, Portland and Seattle and spent our twenties and thirties climbing and backcountry skiing and, uh, mountaineering. And then I had kids and all my hobbies had to squeeze down to three hours. <laughs> right. Well, you go on last trail run in three hours. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, but, uh, yeah, lots of skiing, uh, on Mount hood and, uh, my daughters love paddle boarding. So I do a lot of paddle boarding. Oh, cool. now. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. And, um, do you have any suggestions or advice for someone wanting to get into the outdoor biz or get into writing or storytelling? Yeah, I think, you know, I have, uh, when I left Adidas, um, I started freelancing. And when you work for a big company, uh, oftentimes there's a lot to grumble about. And it's easy to grumble because you have a boss and they have a boss's boss and they have a boss's boss's boss. And there's so many things impacting what you do that it's easy to grumble. But then when you just freelance, you can't grumble anymore because you don't have a boss. <laughs> it's you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's you. And you're like, well, you got yourself into this. Yeah. How do you get yourself out of it? <laughs> and it gave you, at first it was a weird thing, but then I was like, oh my gosh, I can do anything I want. <laughs> I can, I can work for anyone I want. You know what? And as long as I was able to, um, be financially independent, and that doesn't mean being rich by any, by any means, mm -hmm. if my expenses are underneath my revenue, I can do anything you I want. Win. Yeah, exactly. And it gave me a, an insane amount of freedom. And so I would just volunteer work. I would, you know, I'd just go ask people to do stuff. Um, sometimes clients would pay me for one thing and then I would go and do this whole other thing along with what they paid me for. Uh -huh. And I'd come in and I'd present, you know, like, you know, you wanted a headline, but here I'm going to tell you why, you know, this headline is better. And I ran, read, read a, about storytelling and here's, you know, here's why you want this headline versus that. Mm -hmm. And so I would just start doing work for people I wanted. And, you know, I was always into the outdoors. And so, um, it was just a natural thing. I would just call up outdoor companies and say, Hey, let me tell you about, let me give you a free talk. Yeah. That's let, me great. Yeah. let me fly down and, and tell you about story. And, um, it always resonated and started working, you know, with one brand and then another and, and we're deep into it. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's great. That's good Thanks. advice too. It lets you, allows you to be independent. Yeah. Um, and do you have any daily routines you use to keep your sanity? Obviously a trail run is on that list, I would think, or yes. some kind of a run. You know what? There's, <laughs> there's two, two daily routines that, uh, uh, I'm getting in my small town, uh, famous for, and that <laughs> is starting out every day from seven thirty in the morning till 10 at the coffee shop. Same, <laughs> same table, same, food, same everything. Same group of guys. Uh, Do you have one of those you guys get together yeah. and yeah, it's, it's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, uh, that just, that keeps me sane. And there's, there's, you know, I love routine. Uh -huh. Me too. Yeah. You know, yeah that's when you great. have the routine, then you can be creative in other, in, in other ways. Exactly. But, uh, when you have that routine, you can just know when you wake up, what's going to happen for the next two hours. Yeah, exactly. It allows you to start the day or finish the day on your terms. Yeah. Yeah. And then that trail run, I have to say that, um, you know, I think way back in the day when I first started running, I felt like a person who was out of shape who would sometimes run. And like when I ran and got in shape, I'd feel like it was a bonus. Yeah. But anymore, once you start doing it every single day, you feel like once you stop running, you feel like there's, you know, you've kind of, you're, you've entered a hole and there's something yeah. missing in your life. Yep. Yep. I'm the same way. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exercise routines are important. Yeah. And uh, what are some of your favorite books or do you give books as gifts very often? Absolutely. Yeah. You, we, we have um, mm. a whole wall, a big shelf devoted to uh, all the books. I have a big stack of books all the time oh, right cool. next to my bed that I read. And uh, mostly um, about psychology and kind mm. of these frames and how we think and how we think we think and how we actually think. <laughs> I'm, I, love the idea that, um, you know, we, there's, there's some sort of reality out there, but we're never going to be able to see it because our brain mediates yeah. what that reality is. And it only lets certain stuff in. Well, and I, like you, like we talked about earlier, you know, from the time you're a, a little baby getting picked up, our brain is so hardwired in certain yeah. ways that we could want to completely shift it, but we're not going to get out of this hardwired situation. Exactly. And so I just, yeah, I love reading books that get me up out of my own 
thinking Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. make me challenge my, you know, my challenge, my own thinking. Yeah. There was a great book. It was really, you know, there's one big tome that kind of uh, is the Bible. It's called thinking fast and thinking slow. And it talks about our two brain processes. One is our automatic emotional brain that makes most of our decisions. And then there's the slower rational brain um, that kicks in hopefully (laughs) and, (laughs) and kind of, uh, post rationalizes those decisions that your emotions made. Mm. And so it goes through all the different kind of biases we have in our thinking and how we kind of do these, uh, our brain does these slights of hand. Um, and we think we've thought rationally through something. <laughs> right. And in fact, we haven't at all. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. <laughs> that, we'll have we'll the link to that then, one. Yeah. Then the, 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 the short version of that, which is also really entertaining and quick read is called how we decide. Oh, cool. And it's all about how we make decisions every day. You know, do we want, uh, uh, toasted pop tarts or do we want, uh, you know, uh, quinoa right. and right. why, why we decide one way or another and how we think we decide and how we actually decide. Right. Awesome. Now yeah, those are great. We'll link to those in the show notes. I'm, I'm yeah. a sucker for that kind of stuff. Cause it's just, you wonder now I, didn't say, I said I didn't want to do that. Why am I now doing that? <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Yeah, that like I can be alone for hours thinking like, now why did I have that thought? Yeah. When yeah. does that when does that thought break down? Right. Is love is love and truth are those two exactly the same things? I don't think so. When yeah. is <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they go around in circles sometimes. <laughs> when yeah, exactly. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um and do you have a favorite outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? You know, I, I absolutely, it's funny. Um, uh, I was taking a look at that and thinking about that and, uh, I have several, Okay. but one, one rose up and I was like, like, it wasn't the first thing to come to mind. But then once it, once it hit, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so funny. Mm-hmm. I didn't think mm-hmm. about that first. And it's my, uh, Patagonia Houdini jacket. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I've heard somebody else mentioned that. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, it just packs down to nothing. I, you can take it traveling. You can take, I take it on runs and I yeah. break it out. If it gets cold, I use it in the summer. I use it in the winter. It's just, you know, you can do it on, you know, pull it out while you're, you know, belaying. It's just the everywhere, just enough, uh, yeah. you know, windbreak jacket. That's a good one. We'll, we'll link to that too. That's awesome. Um, yeah. and as we go to finish here, is there anything you want to say to the audience or ask of our audience? Um, you know, I think the one thing is, uh, for me is to be, especially if you want to get into kind of, um, well, actually in business in general, Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I would say is that, uh, it's hard to help other people when you can't get up out of your own thinking. So (laughs) That's awesome. The, I love it. The the one word of advice is constantly challenge your own thinking because if you come into a situation with automatic thinking, um, you can't help anybody else get out of their automatic thinking. And most of the most of the world's problems is because we're stuck in our own automatic thought patterns. That's a great that's a great thought. Yep, I love that. Put your own oxygen yeah. mask on first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly it. I, I use that phrase, exact phrase often. <laughs> that's great. I love that. Yeah. And how can yeah. people find you if they want to reach out to ask questions or follow up on anything they, they heard? Yeah, we are at uh, thread underscore creative on Twitter, um, threadcreative.com uh, on the interwebs. And also uh, talcoot.com is the software company that helps uh, helps you tell thousands of different product stories uh, all consistently and quickly. Cool. Well, we'll link to all those in the show notes. Thanks. Make sure everybody can find it. Well, thanks, Bri- uh, Brian. It's been great. I almost called you Bill. I don't know why I did that. But <laughs> <laughs> that's no problem. Maybe I interviewed Bill this morning. <laughs> yeah. No, that's been awesome. Thanks. I, I enjoyed our talk the other day, and I think um, it, this stuff is just fascinating to me and to see how it evolves and see how brands embrace it and evolve it. Um, my perspective is you guys are going to be pretty busy moving forward, so that's great. Yeah, it's it's ramping up yeah, and cool. it's going in a it's I think branding in general and business is going in a good direction right now. Yeah, good. Good for you. Well thanks. Even I appreciate- if the rest of the world isn't. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well yeah. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Rick. All right, you thanks. Too. Yep, bye bye. All right, bye. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Brian Hennessy. 
You can catch up with him on the socials at thread underscore creative on Twitter, threadcreative.com, and talkoot.com. You'll find links to everything we discuss in the show notes at theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash episodes slash 080. Be sure to hit your favorite podcast app and subscribe today. Thanks for listening. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. I've used Audible for many years now. I'm on the road a lot, and Audible allows me to enjoy the great books I discover or are recommended by friends. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash the Outdoor Biz Podcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Start your 30-day free trial with Audible today. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Be sure and go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. Thanks for listening, and until next time, be sure and make time to get outside.